a quick reminder about um, how we want to make our posters as strong as possible. Just want to talk about how you might tighten up your posters um, as we go forward with revisions, etc. The first is think about your overall arguments. So, for example, what is the central theme, the central thesis, the central argument of your poster? If you boiled that down into one sentence, what might it be like? So here are a couple examples um, here, uh, maybe to illustrate the point. So uh, maybe one of the posters I'm working on, one of the species I'm trying to characterize, maybe that thesis is that the abundance and distribution of species X in California were greatly reduced by over-harvesting, which peaked in the 1970s, to the point that it is now only about 5% of its historic abundance, uh, such that it's now facing extinction within two decades. Another example might be, say, for an invasive species, which maybe species Y was first introduced to California in Yolo County agricultural fields in 1953 and has since expanded to the point where it's now a major cause of local extinctions of several native bird species found across the Central Valley. You want to make sure you have that thesis. You want to make sure it's tightening up. You want to make sure it's solid and has specificity in there. Not just the species was abundant and it's declining and now it's endangered to go and extinct. No, add the specificity on there to make a stronger case, a more powerful persuasion for your viewer. Um, uh, as you're doing that, you want to make sure that the the you are, if you're the author or if you're critiquing somebody else's poster, that the authors are offering a strong, convincing argument. How do we do that? We do that by being scholarly, by having numerous, robust peer review references. You're all becoming experts in your topic, and you should be proud of that. And one of the ways you show that you're an expert and one of the ways that you indeed are an expert is that you understand all of the different dimensions to your, uh, to your uh, study organism, to your study challenge. And so that's what we mean by scholarly. I understand the diversity of information out there. I can interpret it. I am aware of what is going on, what the state of affairs is with uh, my organism, for example. You want to be specific. You want to make sure that you don't just say generic dates, but you say specific dates, specific estimates, particular location occurrences, etc. Be detailed, be specific. Next, you want to be generally data dense. We want to have as many measures of historic condition versus con present condition as possible. So a lot of uh, more data, more better. Um, you also want to make sure that your citations are abundant and appropriate. You're not simply citing something at the start of a paragraph and then leaving it, or I'm not recycling that same reference throughout my, um, my uh, introduction or natural history section or what have you. We're generally going to do that by using the author year um, for the in-text citation and then follow the ecology form, uh, formatting for the literature cited section as we've discussed. So that's what this might look like right here. So if we look down the bottom, we see mounting evidence that evergreen canopies exhibit seasonal variations, parentheses, Rodriguez et al., and Smith 2008. So, so these are two references that support that statement. With changes in leaf demography, this is a, a single reference from a single author. And canopy structure, this is two authors um, of this paper from 2011. When we're doing a single author, it's the person's last name and the year. When it's two people, it's the first and second author's last name and the year. When it's more than two, doesn't matter if it's three, 10, 20, whatever, we will use the, um, the et al. So we don't have real long uh, descriptions. The other thing is, is that that's a typical way we do uh, in-text citations. But if you, there, there's other ways to do that. So for example, if I referenced the study of Conrad or Conrad and his colleagues or something of that nature, I, I could say, I could, I could lead, start my sentence with that. So Conrad, in which case um, I would have to then put the year in parentheses, found that blah, 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 blah. So that's in-text citation. Next thing about our posters, we want to talk about relevance. Let's make sure that the stuff we're doing is relevant. Let's make the, sure that the stuff that we are um, uh, communicating makes sense for our particular assignment, our particular thesis. In this case, in the case of our species uh, 
characterization posters, we want to make sure that it's California specific conditions and California specific data. But the same thing would apply for, for any uh, poster. We also want to make sure that we are talking about before the problem and after the problem. So bracket the issue. In the case of declining species, we want to know the, make sure we have data from before the, the stressor and after the stressor. Also want to make sure that we are being uh, discreet and we're be ex exerting some judgment here. So you're not just listing a bunch of random things that you Googled. But you want to really, um, in the context of, of things that might be stressing out our species, we want to talk about the primary stressor, the main thing that's causing issues, that's causing problems. And distinguish that from possible drivers. There's many possible drivers. A lot of you have been listing things like mm, climate change. Well, maybe. But a lot of, in many cases, there's much more direct, proximate, um, uh, and, and, and major causers of problem before we even get to climate change. So let's make sure that you're, you're adequately um, denoting those. Then let's talk about the overall visuals of your poster. So let's make sure that it flows. In the case of our species characterization poster, maybe it's going to start with some natural history, move on to the challenges, and then uh, to management recommendations. Let's make sure that there is some kind of flow, some kind of logical argument and building and movement in your poster. Again, this is a visual medium. This is a visual way of communicating. It's not just a bunch of written paragraphs, right? So you do need to pay attention to the um, uh, visual layout and the visual arguments that you're making. We want to make sure we have a balance between data and negative space, between content and, and, and negative space. We want to make sure it's easy to read, and so the default thing for you guys is going to be to use Arial font and a size large enough to be seen. Go ahead and just use our template size of, of font, and don't go smaller than that, with the possible exception of your uh, literature cited section. You can make those fonts a bit smaller. And then let's make sure that we're balanced overall between um, not just data and negative space, but overall content and negative space. Again, that's one that you can't see until you have your, your drafts together and then can see how the information uh, balances out between intense and less intense uh, elements. For the figures, you want to make sure that you're making a strong convincing argument as with all other aspects of your poster. We want to make sure that the data going into these uh, figures is scholarly want to make sure that we're being specific in terms of the quantification of uh, individuals or distributions or what have you, that we're characterizing the pre and post disturbance or the pre and post problem or pre and post onset of the problem. Um, want to have relatively high, as, as high a density as we can uh, within reason. More data density is generally more engaging, more effective, more useful communication. It allows people to do their own what if scenarios. In most cases, you're probably going to be plotting central tendencies and variances over time. And uh, usually you're going to want to replot the stuff from other figures so that you have it in crisp form, you have it in nice, nice quality controlled form. Um, you don't have to uh, generate 100% new figures, but um, in 99% of the cases you're going to want to do that. Uh, and then when we talk about additional sources uh, for your abundance and distribution data, there's all kinds of sources. And so this is just a very general guide. And you can uh, meet with me and we can talk about uh, suggestions for you guys. But first and foremost would be natural history guides and field guides. And to a lesser extent, um, some museum collections. I don't mean that museum collections are lesser, but they don't all have um, as much of the spatially explicit stuff as we'd like to see, but many of them do. And increasingly, museums are digitizing their collections and making that data um, uh, spatially explicit and online and easy to access. So check those things out. Go look at the LA County Museum of Natural History, look at the um, California Academy of Sciences, et cetera. Really great source would be species recovery plans. And so this is for critters that are endangered or potentially concerned that they would become endangered um, or threatened. And so those can be really great sources either directly in that study or in the um, literature that that study cites. Of course, we have a, a host of online ref, uh, tools such as the California Natural Diversity Database, which you can access through Bio6 at the moment. Um, as we've done earlier in some of our labs, and you can access ArcGIS Living Atlas, California Gap Analysis for Vegetation, um, and so on and so forth. 
A huge source of potential data would be citizen science, since this includes things like Audubon's Christmas bird counts, eBird uh, abundances, iNaturalist, uh, and a whole host of other things, Xerxes Society's counts of, of insects and pollinators and, and so on and so forth. Great source of, source of info. For some of these, you need to register to be able to see the full data, but still a great source of information. Um, harvest estimates, another uh, really useful. Now, this isn't going to tell us the quote unquote population size, but just like the citizen science, it could well give us a great estimation and help us understand the trends over time. And so the examples here would be fishery landing data or hunting records from the state or hunting tag issued, uh, tags issued from the state, um, et cetera. So all the stuff will come together to produce a really great poster. Keep revising. The secret to a good poster isn't writing a good poster, it is revising. So keep revising, 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 and I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, everybody.